Perfect. All right. Well, I'm very, very grateful for ASBA to have me lecture today because, you know, many years back, I didn't see any pediatric airway uh, lectures at these major meetings, uh, you know, AAB, AADSM or ACSDD. So I'm very, very happy. Um, in Dallas, uh, Audrey Yoon and uh, Samantha Weaver, uh, they spoke there. And I was really encouraged to see that uh, this topic is uh, being addressed. And I want to say, though, um, that, you know, pediatric dentistry, of course, it has its stigmas. You have, you know, kids crying. You have sometimes papoose boards and things like that. Brett and I earlier were talking about the fact that if we're doing this, and I can't wait for your lecture, by the way, because he has a lot of great uh, studies and news to, to, to declare uh, at this meeting, uh, in this meeting. So, but anyway, if, if we don't make an impact, on you guys to either refer to someone who will or to screen and look at airway, then we haven't really moved the needle. So it's very important that I hope I can inspire or uh, team members um, get you looking and thinking about childhood development because we can actually influence growth. We can help with development and the whole body health uh, with, with pediatric airway. So. I'll begin with the cover, the topics I'm going to go over. There's going to be some videos at the end. Um, if I go a little bit over, I apologize, but it's a big topic, actually. There's so many things to cover. You know, uh, Gil and I, we were over at uh, a hygienist group, and we showed the Connor Deegan video, and I'll tell you, there's not one dry eye in the room. So when it comes to our kids, we would do anything and everything for them. So keep that in mind. And when you see a mother come in and she's crying, you know, tears of joy, I can, and, uh, and it's because her kid now can thrive and do sports at school and get better grades. I mean, that's kind of the goosebump feeling. You know, who would have thought as a dentist we can get those reactions from families and then seeing the kid improve. So I have a couple of videos there to share with you as well on that topic. So today we're going to go over some just forms. You know, we have the Berlin questionnaire, the watermark. We have the Epworth for adults. Um, we're going to go over some of the screening forms, some, you know, like the stop bang, there's a bears questionnaire that's good for kids that hygienists can use as well. And Zaghi over at Stanford, you know, he talked about studies and yeah, it's important that we have studies because that's how you move the medical community. But if you think about really how many randomized, controlled, double blind placebo systemic reviews that are out there, even for CPAP and tracheotomy, it's really not that much. So yes, we have meta-analysis, we have case series studies, and to me, if I see something happen organically in front of me, if I see the child improve and their airway improve, that to me means everything. So um, yes, but of course more research, more randomized control studies and things like that are very, very important um, to get in the future. And of course nutrition, um, you know, BMI and our food industry and the preservatives and those things, they're just like on this vicious cycle and a lot of these kids are addicted to you know, McDonald's and things like that. So I'll kind of be getting into that a little bit as well. And of course, the infamous tongue tie. And so tongue release, um, and of course, um, breastfeeding, all of that, it has its intricate details and things. And I'll kind of go over them uh, just kind of briefly uh, so that you can know it's very important that all that action that goes on and the under pressure um, and the things the tongue have to do to properly breastfeed really will help develop those muscles, the craniofacial complex. And it's going to be really cool to see. And again, myofunctional therapy, it's growing. And uh, I have to say, uh, there are a lot more uh, things out there. I'm working on a patent for a di digital didgeridoo uh, that can also help uh, give biofeedback. And so there's a lot of things with myofunctional therapy. I believe that airway is a dynamic, ever-changing story. Meaning that if you gain weight, if you lose weight, if you have a car accident, if your body is compensating in some way that's a little bit different than before, you know, we have to look at it dynamically. And so with myofunctional therapy, it's like, you know, my trainer um, imprinted to me certain exercises that I can do to help maintain some muscles and things like that. Anyway, but like, um, not that I can do it very well, but anyhow, uh, myofunctional therapy does the same thing. You know, you get these habits going along with nutrition and forever uh, the child will thrive and grow up to be uh, very, very, uh, uh, healthy and, and prosperous. So there is a lot of options and kind of briefly go over um, them and there's you know always pros and cons to all of them. 
Uh, I think compliance is a very, very important aspect of all of pediatric airway. But that's when, you know, when you start these appliances, sometimes even just a matter of weeks and even a few months, you can see really improved gains like wedding bed, nocturia, things like that improve and the family's like so excited and the kids more energetic and you know grades become better. Those are things that are just kind of help, help, help us along the way. So with the first screening form, um, this is a Chevron University of Michigan. Um, it's kind of like, uh, it doesn't dive into detail as the next one, I'm going to bring the next one up, but this one kind of gives you an idea at the risk factor. So if they score 0 0.33 or higher, they have uh, uh, and if you guys ever need any copies of slides, I'm all open. Um, I'll, I'll give all the slide deck stuff to uh, ASBA. So if you need um, these forms, you can do that. But that's a common form that you can think of, kind of like the uh, watermark errors form, where there's questions that you can answer to uh, evaluate risk. But this one actually goes into more dental uh, aspects, you know, narrow arches, crowding, and more dental-related questions. Um, it's a really good, uh, and uh, Sandra Colson has, has this on her website. And like the stop bang, the bears questionnaire is the same thing that hygienists can use to kind of get the conversation going, if you will, and then um, get things where uh, the family and the parents can start discussing and looking at that. But I think in every general dentistry office, you know, this is something that can just at least uh, get the conversation going and get these kids healthy if they have an airway uh, issue. Of course, comb beam with all the orthotropic options, um, we have to get a comb beam because we're looking at different not just cranial strains, distortions, the whole nine yards, but you have to develop a treatment plan because the child's growing and you're supposed to be thriving. So, you know, we got to look at submental vertex, we have to look at AP towns and find those different things that are important and guide the treatment plan appropriately. And I'm a big fan of Echovision, as you all know. I really do believe that, again, since we're live and dynamic, we need to look at airway behavior, right? We didn't look at collapsibility. We have to look at all those issues as a child's growing and be able to ascertain uh, how things are. Has the collapsibility changed when I did this with the diet or if I did this uh, suture release or all those things that you can do to help the patient grow. Um, you need Echovision to monitor progress, uh, you have an initial baseline and even um, information after a treatment has been completed. And this is one of the strongest studies. I mean, we're talking an end sample of 12,500, almost 12,500 people, kids. Okay, so it's a cohort uh, measured at four and seven years. And it's kind of like a duh type of thing. Yeah, when you're not getting to sleep, it's gonna affect your behavior at school. But you need, what happens though, is this happens. So when a teacher doesn't know, or when a school counselor doesn't know, they don't know what they don't know, right? And then they end up with Adderall, Speed, Ritalin, all that. And it's just like, not only that, the kid's labeled. You know, the kid's like, oh, I guess there's just something wrong with me. I can't pay attention or I'm really hyperactive, I don't get it. When all it is is they're not sleeping at night. You know, they have airway issues or swollen tonsils or things that the body does to try to compensate and help uh, the kid uh, survive. You know, our body always wants to survive more than anything else. It doesn't care about beauty or symmetry. If it can't get the air, it's gonna do everything and anything that it can do to compensate to get the air in. And so for children, I want to underscore that it just takes AHI-1 to, consider, to be considered uh, OSA. Um, the thing too is, is a little trick, and I think it's now different because, you know, mom and dads, they can record their kids breathing and sleeping at night. Um, it's because when you do a PSG, you have to have two registered polysomnograph technicians to do that. So, Monetarily, it's not as beneficial for the sleep in these, but hey, if your kid is gasping for air and they're not thriving, they're not growing, you better bet that it's important that they uh, get that. But there's also the Knox T3, which is take home, that's approved for pediatric. Of course, um, you know, you can get uh, pulse oximeters, and for kids, make sure you get the pediatric uh, clips, uh, and you can monitor oxygen saturation levels, so important. And so I have to say, yeah, really, it all begins at birth. Um, there's people even arguing that in utero, there's you know, certain uh, trauma and things like that. But even natural childbirth, that's, that's a lot of pressure um, and a lot of forces there. And so when you properly breastfeed, what's going on is inside the mouth, there is an under pressure about 60 um, millimeter of mercury inside. And so the tongue has to go up to the palate 
And then, in order to get the milk to be induced to come out, you have to triple that to 150, about 150 millimeters of mercury. And that whole action, you can imagine, is so natural, but also so good for developing the muscles, getting oxygen saturation. When you're using a nursing bottle, you're just, you're just compressing that. So the action isn't there, the muscles are underdeveloped, the oxygen levels are, are down. So if you have a tongue tie like that, that's the first thing that we need to see early on. Hey, we need to talk about tongue release. So very, very important to uh, getting good and proper um, airway development by breastfeeding. And of course, uh, as I was saying earlier, there's a lot of trauma even in natural childbirth, right? So there are things uh, that chiropractors and specialist AOs can do for baby, baby work. Um, I was just at a seminar, a uh, chirodontic seminar, and it was crazy. I had to unlearn uh, a lot of the things I learned in dental school, uh, but the squamous sutures, the actual skull bones, even in adults, they're movable. And I was able to like, you know, move a nose and the maxilla, drop it down, and I know Tara, you've, you've seen Bob do that too, right? It's just crazy stuff, but hey, this is about getting everything that we can to get the body aligned, do orthotrepics, grow the airway properly, and then finish the case in that trajectory. It's very, very powerful, and, and in my opinion, that's, that's what lasts. That's what keeps the patient balanced and stable through life. The koala hole, there's some studies showing that this helps with better latching, but of course, if there's acid reflux and things like that, um, this is a, a recommended way. And I think a lot of the African tribes and the uh, Aboriginal uh, cultures, they breastfeed this way. And in Western society, we breastfeed this way. So I think there's a lot of benefit to using the koala hold. And there are these, uh, of course, uh, tongue mobility, tongue tie. Uh, rulers you can use, but this one is just uh, a classification cut lows, and, and if you have like the Eiffel Tower or the four, you know, hey, this is a severe tongue uh, tie issue. Uh, but of course, when you talk to Zagi, there is, you know, fascial or submucosal band. There could be deeper um, tongue ties that involve more surgery. But what was cool, I don't know if you guys saw this video that he did the deep front line. So once he released the tongue, on a patient, it was crazy. Like she can feel tingling and sensations all the way through to her feet uh, before, uh, and it was like a, wow, this is crazy, but the deep front line goes all the way down the body, and so a tongue tie can actually be connected to all of that. And this is the range of motion. There's a classification there as well. Um, so it's just the mobility of uh, the tongue and um, just another tool to have and use and measure and get prelim preliminary data done. So kind of this is what you know, goes on. We have a lot of things in society nowadays that we think is okay, it's commonplace, but it's really not. I mean, because you know, like I said earlier, if you're using the nursing bottle, you're having these pacifiers and things like that, you're not gonna get the proper craniofacial development, the proper stimulation, the proper forces that you need to get the, you know, the whole complex, the muscles of mastication, all of them growing and getting you know, firm and their tonus and stuff like that improved. So that becomes kind of like this whole vicious cycle. And then you have so much compensation, um, your skeleton and, and you know, everything just becomes this uh, messed, messed up type of uh, system. And that's why you see people with forward head postures or they have side bends or you know, cranial strains and things like that because their body is trying to be in balance but also trying to get better airway and better oxygen in. And then in the classic uh, forward head posture, it's actually a posterior torsal issue where again the body is you know uh, and you see these allergic shiners you see the Dennis Morgan lines um, a lot of that you know mouth breathing stuff you're not getting nitric oxide and that's what's important it's not just the nitric oxide they did a study and they show that if you breathe through your nose you get almost twice the volume, I mean, this is really important. This underscores the need, and, and yeah, definitely look this up, read this article, you take a photo, it's, it's, it's cool because, hey, if we're breathing through our mouth, not only are we missing the nitric oxide component, but we're having a narrower airway. So it's a thing just to keep in mind. So this is why myofunctional therapy, I can't under stress, I can't stress more, excuse me, I can't uh, stress anymore, but it's so important that we realize, yeah, when you breathe through your nose, it's really how nature intended it to be. And kind of really, you know, this is what evolution, why we have issues, you know, because mammals and stuff, we have the velo epiglottal overlap, uh, but guess what? We became vertically standing and our pharynx grew, and our pharynx became a collapsible system. 
Uh, there's really no bone, so the whole tonus of the pharyngeal muscles, this is why myofunctional therapy, didgeridoo playing, those things are very, very important because it'll help strengthen, you know, if I want to get big muscles, I better go weight lift and stuff. And so those are things that you can do for these pharyngeal muscles. And that whole system is so complex. There's the vagal plexus, right? And that's just so intricate. There's so many levels of, you know, then we think about central sleep apnea, loop gain, all those things where, you know, sometimes you're dealing with non-responders and whatnot, but there's a whole neurology aspect that I think comes with, I mean, it's because we have to have a big brain, we have to speak, so when we evolved, this is how, and if we evolve even more, we'll look like an alien, and we're not even gonna be able to breathe by then, so it's one of those uh, things that they use to describe. And of course, you add on top of that, you have uh, the insults from the food, the preservatives and things like that. And we're seeing mandibles shrink. We're seeing like uh, vertical growth patterns. We're seeing clockwise uh, compensation, things like that. And so it's so important that after breastfeeding, we don't do Gerber baby foods. We don't do soft foods. We don't do things that are all much that we want them to chew on a, a carrot or apple um, you know get those mastication forces going because it's so important uh, to grow the complex otherwise as I was alluding to earlier you get these issues where you have everything that's compensating and I know these people these kids walk into your offices all the time and so it's very important that we you know find that and either we do treatment ourselves or refer to uh, someone who will and that may be even an SOT or uh, Rakapato physical therapist or AO um, or someone that will help with that uh, aspect. In myofunctional therapy, basically, I think if we were to boil it down to three, it's three main things. We want good lip seal, we want nasal breathing, and we want the tongue to be in its proper place. And so there are a lot of different exercises, and some myofunctional therapists, like uh, with Vivos, they can do it all through uh, telemedicine, so it, you don't have to have someone locally. Uh, or, I mean, I prefer live, because then you can actually you know, get feedback and you know, do the exercises in person, but it's really, really important. And this is where, again, I, I can't stress, I don't wanna do any orthotropic courses unless the family is uh, in agreement that they do myofunctional therapy in concurrent with that because it's gonna fail. And even when you do tongue tie release, uh, there are studies that show they don't do so well if you don't add the myofunctional therapy component to that. And a weight, of course, but you know, some studies are, are pretty important. I mean, like if you think uh, each unit increase in BMI results in 12% higher risk of OSA. So to me, uh, yeah, just nutrition diet, um, I was joking actually with the hygienist the other day, saying about like, you know, McDonald's, you know, if you throw a hamburger out in the yard, the yard for three or four months, there's no mold that grows on it. There's, there's, there's you know, or, or, or they use real chicken all of a sudden, right? They're chicken McNuggets, like what were they using before? So those things I think definitely are designed to get kids addicted. Um, and so this is one of those things where I think it's important that uh, we, we look at these factors in nutrition and health. So a lot of these things kind of are, I mean, you guys already know them, daytime sleepiness, retronathia, micronathia, all those things are, are, are definitely signs and symptoms. Uh, I can never say his name right, but uh, Guillaume Manon, okay, Christian, and I met him um, uh, before he passed, but you know, he describes this very uh, cycle that we've been talking about just now. You know, you have mouth breathing, those issues, and you have inflammation, and it becomes this vicious cycle. The tonsils get large, and then pretty soon you have forward head posture, you have abnormal facial growth, and the body's always compensating and things like that, so it becomes this loop, and this is where nowadays we have so many options to intervene and create a change in that. And again, this is what I was alluding to earlier, that if you look at studies, because I know a lot of MDs, you know, they won't even consider a conversation or a discussion unless you say, here's all the medical backing. But then realize, too, they can cherry pick their studies as well. Um, I just have to say, though, with the case feasibility, with the meta-analysis that I've seen, and the white papers and stuff that are out, it's incredible. It, this stuff really is important and life-changing. Um, so this is a video, uh, actually I have to give credit to Vivos for this, but I think I have to go up there to play the video. You guys are still awake, yay. So, okay. Just a few hundred years ago, the human face was different. It was forward grown. Her wide profile and large gentle arches ensured straight teeth and moved her tongue. 
Most importantly, she had plenty of space behind her upper jaw so she could breathe through her nose with ease. The modern face has changed. From childhood, her dental arches are less developed, crowding her teeth and giving her less space for her tongue, which impacts her airway. Many believe this stems from a number of causes, such as allergies that affect breathing. Another is the poor nutrition and softness of modern diets, causing toddlers to have underdeveloped chewing muscles and smaller dental arches. Because her upper jaw is too far back, she will struggle to breathe normally through her nose. To get more oxygen, she will compensate by opening her mouth to breathe, bringing her lower jaw down and back creating a downswing of the face. This is how her undergrown upper jaw creates the appearance of butt teeth. She's actually compensating in order to breathe. If not corrected, the problem carries into adulthood. Extractions were documented in the 1600s as a way to treat crowding, Although they are a quick fix, they don't treat the problem of underdeveloped arches and have been implicated in harming the facial profile, making them the subject of much debate even today. In order to breathe, she will slouch her head forward to prop open her airway, creating a lifetime of neck and back pain. This is the infamous forward head posture. Having a healthy airway is crucial to the survival of life, and especially so during sleep. When muscles around the throat relax during sleep, a healthy airway stays open because the tongue is sitting forward and has enough space to be suctioned up against the full grown palate. With underdeveloped jaws and dental arches, the palate is too small for the fully grown tongue, which is sitting back to begin with. When she sleeps, her tongue does not suction, rather it falls back and cuts off her airway. This is obstructive sleep apnea. Like crooked teeth, it's a modern condition, however, it can reduce life expectancy. Not surprisingly, obstructive sleep apnea is marked by the same traits that describe the headgear effect. Both jaws are grown down and back, creating a clockwise rotation in the lower third of the face. The myth of the overgrown upper jaw that needs to be held back has long since been replaced with science. Science has shown that young children can be buck tooth naturally, and that the lower jaw catches up over time with a fully developed upper jaw. Essential to this is nutrition, the use of chewing muscles early on in life, and good breathing habits. This means breathing through the nose with the mouth closed and the tongue resting up against the palate. Also, the practice of maxillary expansion has been shown for over a century to correct crooked teeth and improve nasal breathing space. And since 1918, oral facial exercises have been shown to correct mouth breathing habits. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop that. Okay, so yeah, and uh, earlier I was talking about Zagi saying that when you combine myofunctional therapy with tongue tie release, when you combine it with any aspect, any orthotropic aspect, you're going to see resolution. And that again falls into the fact that I believe that we're always changing so many things from airway to, I mean, from your weight to, you know, trauma to if you fall down the wrong way at school, uh, all those things, sports, they'll, they'll, you know, we're ever changing. So it's important to know that myofunctional therapy and getting those exercises and tips ingrained or engrammed into uh, your brain is very important. And again, um, I'm, I add some slides. For, I've done this lecture before, but I went to the Amen Clinic with my own kid. Um, my oldest, I've treated uh, 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 later, so he had to actually get a tonsillectomy, adenectomy. But my youngest, I started earlier with Vivos, and um, he was having trouble at school. 
Um, and then later on, I'll get to with the slides, but yeah, he went to Amen Clinic and did a brain scan. It was incredible. I, I just, I can't say enough about that process and getting him on natural serotonin, GABA and things like that. He's doing so much better at school. Um, but anyhow, I'm kind of jumping the gun there, but working interdisciplinary is so important with all these other uh, specialists and people that I've talked about. So realize, of course, that when we talk about pediatric airway, we can't do MRDs, you know? We're in mixed dentition, things are changing, so you just can't really find a therapeutic position and hold it there, right? Um, so we're always in dynamic, we're moving parts and pieces. And so one of them, of course, uh, I, many of you guys have you've heard of uh, orthotain, it changed to heart healthy start. Uh, that, myobrace, vivos, they all have these uh, starters and guide systems and sometimes even like I'll tell parents that if the kids on the starters, because you're seeing them as young as you know, four years old, three years old, if they can even keep it in for just a couple of hours, then they increase uh, that time frame. And when they get into the VG series, for example, into the Vivos, then they can wear it during the day three to four hours as well. I mean, it really helps guide growth. That with myofunctional therapy and nutrition, um, it is just really awesome. And it really doesn't take much. You'll see good resolution. And again, I have to say, if you're afraid into jumping in this, it's not like you're giving shots you know, to patients. You're not papoose boarding them if you did that. Um, but you know what I mean? This is just families coming in with kids that have issues. They've been labeled and they're on drugs or whatnot, uh, Ritalin being the drug. Um, you have the ability to, to make an impact on their growth and development. And of course, um, you know, there's uh, other options when they're older, uh, like with the DNA, or uh, uh, I know Bob Walker, he always likes the BB1. Um, those are expansion, and I really think it's important to think about concentric expansion. Sometimes appliances only expand in one way, either the transverse or the anterior, but you want the whole palate to grow, right, and the mandible to follow with that. So getting those uh, criteria, getting the cranial strains and distortions set, doing orthopedic growth, now, if a patient came in with TMJ issues, though, and have TMD and the FASA and all those things are problematic, you do that first, and then you do the orthopedic growth, and then you can finish the case with any, you know, controlled arch ortho, Invisalign, uh, whatever you like. And with the facial beauty, they have also a fix in the removable system. And for kids, yes, the removable system. This one actually grows anteriorly very rapidly. It's generally about four, three to four months. Um, and then you use ortho to finish the case. But yes, that with myofunctional therapy and all those other uh, cranial movements and uh, manipulations are essential for the success of this. That's with the Facial Beauty Institute. And then, of course, um, you know, there's just Invisalign. Invisalign, Audrey Yoon is working with Stanford big time at uh, Dallas. She says the studies are going. They're developing ways to uh, increase palate dimensions. Um, I don't know if it's tipping or not, but um, it is there to offer as an option. And Invisalign, of course, has you know, been around so well, so, so far successfully. You have so many other companies now doing aligners to uh, correct that, but that's an option as well. Of course, alpha appliance, you have to be very ortho savvy, uh, you know, wire bending style type uh, person, but Eric Nordstrom, of course, uh, uh, develop that. And there's actually different types of alpha appliances, but it's all light wire, low forces, and, and it's just it's, it's an awesome option to think about, but be uh, cognizant that you have to be very like ortho savvy in bending wires. And this is where I was talking about these cranial strains and things like that. Now, of course, um, you know, people are thinking scope of practice. This is where you get the chiropractor. This is where you get the SOT to get involved. But if you can talk to your patient about it and have some knowledge, it's really important because we now know there's descending and ascending disorders, right? So if you have something where your leg is longer or where your you know, sacral iliac area is off balance, you need to work with an S SOT, but they can use things like trochanter belts or special underwear or foot orthotics to balance the body up. And that will help on this part. And on this part and up, our occlusion, our occlusion of how our teeth fit together, that's the gap. So if we have cranial strains, AP, lateral strains, we can correct that and then uh, fill in the gap and maintain that. The chiropractor that I went to uh, the seminar with, he says he will not bring chiropractors to his seminar without a dentist because all those adjustments that he does, everything that he works so hard, 
the minute the patient swallows the, and functions, it all collapses. So we need to find, fill that gap. You know, you can use an aqualizer, you can use a bite material, you can use a occlusal pad or a resin pad. Hold that, and it holds. And then actually, when everything corrects itself, then you translate the bite, do ortho, do restorative, whatever it is. And so, to me, that's a very big, holistic, awesome picture to get the patient not only healthier, but stabilized in that balanced position. Yes? Sure. Because you're talking about descending and descending disorders. Yes. A paper published in Cranio by a Dr. Hobson, a Rackabato therapist, okay. in an editorial. And in 72% of patients, you would get complete correction of hip pucks by putting an aqualizer in their body, in their mouth. I love that you said that. three minutes, it lets you differentiate ascending from descending disorders. Thank you. So, thank you, yes. And you know, I've also clinically seen when Bob Walker, like first of all, I felt a little bit euphoric when he aligned me, but I knew the minute I start, you know, without the aqualizer, like you said, the whole thing's gonna fall apart. So I, yeah, thank you for saying that. So, I mean, I mean, Gil, I took you there, right? I mean, you would not believe what you've seen unless we did to each other what we did. So I really think that that's, you know, it's so important that, that this is not just, you know, voodoo or snake oil. This is really in your face happening you know, my maxilla and my nose is moving type of thing, you know? So, yeah. And of course, um, there's always been, this is the oldest, there's a rapid palate expansion and stuff like that, but sometimes when you do things too fast, I mean, we've all seen cases where, well, may, were the forces good? Because there's root resorption, there's dehiscence, there's all these other, like, things going on, and all the times the orthodontist says, nope, the, just the teeth presented themselves that way. I'm like, no, these centrals, their, like, roots are half the size they're supposed to be, something, you know, force-wise. So when you do a lot of rapid paddle, you may uh, get some, um, other uh, double-edged sword type things where you have the dehiscence or inflammation or relapse or things like that. So um, speed is important. And this is where I think Vivos and a lot of companies really respect that because you, you try to hone in on that patient's um, medical history, their growth rate and all that, and then you're doing these adjustments in accordance to that patient's unique uh, physiology and phenotype and presentation. So. I think compliance is, of course, earlier, but this is when there's not compliance going on. You know, you shut the door and have a come to Jesus moment with the parents and say, hey, look, I told you from the very beginning, this is gonna be an eight month or 10 month treatment plan. And this is your child's, you know, growth. This is his or her health. And usually that uh, gets them back on track. And so those are just, uh, I'm gonna go to some uh, case uh, presentations, a uh, couple of cases. So this is a gal, um, Scarlett, she came to me at four years old. So yes, this young, this early. And some of the photos you'll be able to see that she has these uh, presentation of symptoms. Allergic shiners, you know, she's not doing well. She's not doing well at home and in uh, preschool, she's not doing well either. Um, mom says, oh my gosh, you know, she wakes up everybody. She's really, you know, antsy and I'll get to the video because it's an eight minute video, so let me play that video. But I kind of wanted to share this raw, my next video is on a Down syndrome kid, this raw feeling that we get because when the mom gets involved, and she's a special ed teacher, and so you can tell at the end, she's like saying, you know what, more dentists need to do that and do this. And that's what Brenda and I was talking about earlier. We, the point of these pediatric airway is to hope to get you guys to start looking in and doing them yourselves.
And seriously, once you implement, you know, uh, biofunctional therapy, nutrition, um, you know, that inflammation goes away. Well, guess what? The tonsils and those things, they'll respond to that. So um, I totally believe, of course, uh, adenoid tonsillectomy, yes, but if there is a chance where you get family involved, involvement and you get those things, it's, it's incredible. And this is the part where it gets interesting because she's talking about changes that she sees as a mother. And sometimes you'll see the bedwetting issue, um, you know, I know even John will tell you that, you know, just a few weeks of that, of, of getting into this protocol can uh, correct that. So it's just amazing.
She's so sweet. She, she's. Up, lip taping, getting the malfunctional therapy, nasal breathing exercises. And remember, if you breathe through your nose, just think of that comb beam picture of the airway being bigger when you're breathing through your nose. Yeah, sometimes when I don't have my night guard and I still snore. <laughs> okay. Oop. Okay, so this is the Down syndrome, uh, Gabriel. And of course, with Down syndrome, you find that there's uh, uh, you know, all these uh, issues, uh, brachycephalic presentation, of the occiput, flat face, all these things. So yeah, and even if you look at some of the, yeah, this is his airway, a uh, CT. How are you gonna get, if you're an oxygen molecule, how are you gonna get to his lung, right? It's like, there's just really no, no way. So this is very serious. But I recommend, you know, if you guys can, it's not expensive to get a symmetrograph so you can look at um, distortions, you can look at imbalance, you can look at asymmetries, and you can see that, you know, he not only has AP strain, lateral strain, and some of these other photos, if you can take them, while showing, you can see the flat uh, face presentation uh, common, but you can see, I know that this head's a little bit rotated, I don't know if the pointer works. Well, anyway, you can see one side already, it's the AP uh, position is different, so there's AP strain. Um, even looking at the nostrils, you can see they're not the same shape, and there's kind of a pull on his uh, right side. So those are things to kind of be aware of, and of course he uh, has thumb sucking. So that's one thing in the video you'll see, uh, we're going to work with mom. And I really believe that sometimes, you know, using those appliances that are like those crib, like crazy things, I don't know, I think it's more of a kind of a security blanket or something that the kid does. Uh, because there's some kind of emotional or something lacking there. So I think a really good, solid, proven way, and I told the mom to do this, just like the malfunctional therapy exercises for a digit sucking, is if you can, when you see that, if it's a 10 times, if it's 100 times, if it's 1,000 times, just be patient, pull the tongue out, give the kid a hug. Pull the tongue. So I think these um, nonverbal cues and stuff, you know, is letting the kid know that don't worry, you don't need to do this to feel better, I'm here. And I know it sounds silly, but I've seen uh, a lot of patients report back that just something as simple as that has to make a tremendous difference uh, with uh, that. Now, I'm not gonna play these two videos because the mom recorded them and on the cell phone you could barely hear, but he sleeps with his mouth open, something with his tongue out. And you can see he's just trying to fight for a patent uh, airway. So this, this, this one I'll play. And this is the mom, and uh, just kind of, it's an introductory into what we're gonna do, but again, I just wanna share this video and then we'll be done with, uh, with my son next. Can you guys up the volume? Up until recently, he was in our bed every night, and oftentimes 
He would wake up, he'd come out of bed, he'd come in for a break, I'd put him back, and if his daughter was not sleeping, um, and he was not sleeping, yeah. and he just is super restless. He will, I have on, um, I've seen him multiple times where he is in bed with us, but he will stop breathing, and it's very rare that he goes a full sleep cycle without mm-hmm. waking himself up. He, he's just, his legs are restless, um, which then affects our sleep, but since putting him in the top bunk of the bunk bed, mm-hmm. he can't get down as easily, mm-hmm. and to be safe, he has railings, mm-hmm. um, but I will still go in and take, you know, tug him up at night, but he's usually always foot flopped over, he's oftentimes will be bent at the waist, mm-hmm. um, he just doesn't sleep well, he doesn't sleep well. And obviously, it's only noon, and he is yeah. exhausted, and um, it affects how long he can concentrate during the day, and um, I don't know if there's, he just is always a rest of sleeper, and yeah. he definitely has um, indications that he still has to sleep that much. So earlier we did some examination of the bone and some bone and the bone and the classic signs and tissues of the small condition. Um, he has an HI of like 4.7 or something like that too, so. Yeah, the family is really like Googling, doing everything, because, you know, I don't want to start any failure cases. If the parents aren't involved in situation, like there's just no way I would start that case. But, I mean, you know, it's also a matter of us educating the parents, making sure that, hey, if we're in on this together, you know, we can have resolution and, and so. And the mom's already starting with the big three and the habits and things like that. So I'll go ahead and just kind of, but kind of you get the idea of where, you know, get the family involved and, you know, the sky's the limit. And I'm going to go to my own kids. So Warren's, uh, I have three boys. He's the youngest. Um, and uh, we had a little bit of the, the vivo system and uh, some myofunctional going on for him. But I don't know. I think maybe it's a emotion slash, you know, I don't know. I mean, his brothers don't pick on him. He's not bullied or anything like that. But um, we just needed this one extra topping, if you will. And it was so worth it. So um, they did this uh, kind of reflex uh, thing on a computer. They injected dye. So you had a brain scan. And inside the Brain scan, uh, they're looking at this diamond pattern between the basal ganglia and the thalamus. And be- when kids have that, they show that they have certain issues in the caudate nucleus, the tension, nervousness, anxiety, panic, uh, predicting the worst. And he really is like that. Not that he's pessimistic, but he was very always saying, oh, dad, well, w- what if I did this? And I don't want to participate. Or I don't want to, you know, because just, I, you know, there's, there's some issues. And so with supplements, um, it's awesome. You know, they, they break it down for you like a really cool treatment plan, not just diet, nutrition but doing things like maybe can he learn juggling or ping pong or one of those exercises in addition uh, to have brain support take the omega-3 powder we're making smoothies for him um, as well as the uh, GABA serotonin for mood and calmness and even for the neuro PS for the ADHD stuff so he was able to actually uh, win in a soccer game make a couple of goals and there's just no way he would have done that uh, without this extra uh, you know homeopathic but very effective way to get him uh, to be school grades are improved and so I know this is it it's when your own kid and you see this I, I can't not help but be in a setting like this to share that with you because it affects my family and I hope you guys thank you for not falling asleep but um, I appreciate everything and once again thank you